Today we continue our Don't Kill My Vibe series. And if you got your Bibles, you can pull out your sermon notes, your service guide's there to take notes. And if you got your Bibles, you can turn with me to, uh, let me see here, John chapter 4. I'll be getting to John chapter 4 here in just a moment. But uh, we're wrapping up our Don't Kill My Vibe series. And uh, last uh, for next week, because we got Father's Day coming up, come on, who's excited to celebrate the fathers? Come on, yeah. It's going to be so good. It's one of our favorite Sundays of the year. I mean, especially for the men, because we got some gifts for you guys. I mean, we got some root beer floats. Come on, somebody. Who loves some root beer floats? No men. Okay, can I get a ha? Huh? Come on, men. Come on, let me know. Let me get some root beer floats. Okay, okay. Then you can leave them for all us, all right? So, but, uh, man, we're going to have a bunch of, we're going to have prizes, going to have fun. It's going to be a blast. You don't want to miss next week. Invite your dad to church. It's going to be so much fun. And so, but this week, we're wrapping up. Um, our series, Don't Kill My Vibe. And there's a phrase that says that we follow by is, man, who's in your circle? And we've been breaking this down, and we've been talking about relationships. We talked about marriage. Uh, Jesse came, and he preached a phenomenal message on soul ties, talking about purity. And it's been about relationships and, like, who's in your life? Does it point to Jesus or does it point to the world? And this week, I just couldn't, I couldn't get out of my heart. Uh, to preach about something. I was going to do it in our next series coming up after Father's Day called Purpose, uh, but I couldn't get it out of my heart, and so I felt like God wanted to uh, preach about it today. But when you talk about who's in your circle, the first thing that I think about is who's in my circle? Is it just saved people or is it also lost people? It got real quiet. Because when I think about that, in other words, it's amazing how we get saved and we can get comfortable within our Christianity. And we forget about one of the purposes of being a believer. The Bible says to seek and save those who are lost. And part of our circle needs to be, do we have people in our life that need to meet the same Jesus that we meet? Come on, it's real quiet up in here. Come on, let me know I'm talking to somebody. Are you with me? How many would agree? We, we get saved, not to just become a clique of salvation, but we get saved to walk in Jesus, but to also introduce to as many people who need Jesus and the same God that saved me needs to be the same God that can save their marriage and save their family. Can I get an amen? Come on, all right? Come on, you got to turn it up with me today a little bit. And so, man, this is my passion. Is uh, You're going to see me get fired up a little bit because there's nothing I'm more passionate about than talking about the need of bringing Jesus to people who need him. And if you love God and you love people, it's a core value. It's a theme of the whole Bible. Love God and love people. And that's our values, love God, love people, strive for excellence, and choose joy. But it's not just a phrase that we throw up on a cool banner. No, it's something we live by. It's something we, every single day, we dream. Man, we want to love God, and because of God's love for me, I want to do everything I can to share that same love with people who need the same thing. And I, if you want to take notes, here's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about, I want to answer this one question. Do you love lost people? Like, do you love lost people? We're going to break down why God loves lost people. Man, who's in your circle? I got a top 10 hit list. So we're like, huh? It's the top 10 people in my life that I'm believing that I'm going to, I'm going to get them saved someday. They're in my circle. They're in my family. They're around me every day. And if you don't got a top 10 list, I encourage you to get a top 10 list. Because at the end of the day, when, when it comes to heaven, you're not going to be able to take your nice car, your nice building. You're not going to be able to take your bank account. You're not going to be able to take any. There's only one thing we can take to heaven with us, and that is people. So why not introduce people to the God that saved your life and to save their life? Come on, somebody. Now you're starting to catch on a little bit, all right? You got to get fired up about this. So do you love lost people? And if there's people in your circle that don't need Jesus, I'm going to ask you, the question, do you really love lost people? Because if they are, they're in your circle. And they don't kill your vibe. You don't enter their world, but you bring them into your world, which is Jesus. That's what this is all about. Y'all with me today? Come on, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Jesus, we love you. We thank you, man. Do your thing, Jesus. Do what you do. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our souls. I pray we leave here today encouraged more than ever to love people the way you love them and to love our family the way you love them, God and a passion and a drive to get out there and share our story and what you've done for us. And God, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen, amen. If you believe it, give it up one more time for God's word. Come on, can we do that? It's going to be a good day. 
Do you love lost people? Now, I want to start this off with a scripture that I didn't tell you to turn there because I'm going to read it out of the message translation so you can see it on the big screen on the Bible, a big screen Bible behind me there. But 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through 23 in the message translation. Here's what, here's what it said. I love Paul's approach to loving people. Anybody remember, the, anybody remember the man named Paul in the Bible? Paul was a man who was blind, right? He actually killed Christians, but God radically changed his life and put his call. He gave him his sight back, and now he was called to go and increase the local church, but to go and reach the lost. And so in this scripture, you see his passion not only for loving God, but you see his passion for loving people. And here's what it says in, in verse 19, starting off. It says this, even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. And he goes on to list the different people, religious, non-religious, meticulous, moralist, loose living immoralist, the defeated, the demoralized, the whoever. Come on, somebody say whoever. Come on, that's who we are as a church, man. The whoever can walk up in church and find Jesus. Amen on that? And it says, I didn't take any of their way. This is key. I didn't take any of their way of life, but I kept my bearings in Christ. In other words, I didn't enter their world, but I invited them into my world, which is Jesus. And then I love this part. It says, and I entered their world. Come on. And he tried to experience things from their point of view. In other words, he didn't make them jump through certain hoops and then you can come to Jesus. He didn't say, hey, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to hang out with you when you get this right and you get this right. No, he said, I'm going to come to where you are. I'm going to love you right where you are because that's what Jesus did for me. And I'm going to love you back to life what God wants you to do. Can I get, that's a good place to say amen if you want to. Okay, you're learning church. Here we go. And it goes on to say, I tried to experience everything from their point of view. Sometimes, man, we just need to, it's amazing how quickly we tell people what to do when we just need to, lead, need to hear from their heart so we can speak to their heart. You got to expose the heart before you can do surgery on it. You got to let hear their point of view. And it goes on to say, I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God saved life. In other words, God saved me. So I'm going to do everything I can to introduce people to the same God that saved me so that they can have the same story. And I love this. He said, I did all this because of the message. How many are thankful for the message of Jesus and the grace of God and what it's done for your life today? And he goes on to say, I did. I love this part. I didn't just talk about it, but I wanted to be in on it. Come on, tell your neighbor, be in on it. Come on, be in on it. In other words, it ain't just talk, but I'm about to do something radical. And then I love what verse 26 says. I love this part. It says, I don't know about you, but I'm running hard to, fin to the finish line, and I'm giving it everything I've got. Come on, don't, yeah, that's a good place to put your hands together. Because there's passion behind that. Do you see the passion behind Paul in that? He's like, I'm realizing that time is running out. The one thing that you can't get back is time. The one thing you can't get back is your yesterday. You can't get your last week back. You can't get your last month, and you can't get your last year. And Paul is saying, time is running out, so I'm going to do everything that I've got to do till every day I'm going to run like I'm running to the finish line. Every single day I'm going to give my absolute best because the God that saved me, there's other people that they experience the same God that saved me. It's like they need to do it. They need to understand. There's a passion that needs to rise up on the inside of you that every single day, if God changed my life, he can change my friend's life. If God changed my marriage, he can change their marriage. If God freed me from addiction, he can free them from addiction. If God set me free, he can set them free. There's a passion that needs to arise, not necessarily where you, enter, where you uh, conform to their world, but you enter their world and they conform to who Jesus is in you. Are you following me? Yeah. Man, do you, do you love lost people? When I think about this, you think about, um, I think about, man, love your neighbor. You know how in the Bible says love your neighbor? And what, what does that mean? Does it really mean like love your neighbor? Yeah, it means love your neighbor. Uh, I, me and my wife were just blessed to move into a new neighborhood uh, and got into a new home, and we're super thankful for that. 
and uh, we've been living in different neighborhoods before, but we really didn't have uh, necessarily certain neighbors. We tried to build a relationship with some of them, but there wasn't a whole lot of relationship. We did our best, you know. But when we moved into this new neighborhood, we were just like blown away, weren't we, baby? I'm just blown away. It's like all of a sudden, all the neighbors came to us, and they're bringing us free gifts, and they're like, you're the pastor, aren't you? I'm like, how do you even know I'm the pastor? I'm the pastor on the block. That's what we are. We're the pastors on the block. And so they know if we have a big party at the house, like, oh, they're, they're ministering or something like that, right? And, I mean, it was amazing. For a whole week, everybody showed up at our doorstep and brought us gift baskets, brought us groceries, bought us food and cakes. I'm like, can we go away for a week and come back? Come on, right? Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. It's like, welcome to the neighborhood. I'm like, I ain't ever leaving. If I need a cup of sugar, I don't got to go to Kroger. I go next door. This is beautiful. I love it. Come on, how many want sugar over Splenda? Come on, any day, right? Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Splenda is of the devil. Ah. And, um, and I, just, I just like, it was amazing. And so I thought to myself, God, thank you for bringing relationships in my life and in our life to where we can be an example of who you are. They, they, know, they know that we love Jesus, but, but yet they don't feel weird hanging out with us, which is awesome. I love that, right? And my kids can love them, we can love them. And I thought to myself, love your neighbor. Does that really mean your neighbor? Yeah, it does. But from a different standpoint, what does a neighbor necessarily mean? Neighbor means somebody who's near you. Somebody who's next to you. So define what neighbor is. Neighbor just isn't in the house next to you. Neighbor is the coworker that you've been sitting across for the last five years that needs to know Jesus. A neighbor is the person that you pass by on aisle 17 at H-E-B to get you some Ben and Jerry's. Come on, somebody, all right? You pass by. A neighbor is the homeless person you pass by walking in, inviting them to church. Neighbor is, is every person that you encounter. You encounter somebody every single day that needs the same God that you need. And the question is, do you love lost people enough to introduce them to a God-saved life because God saved you? If you don't think there's lost people, just skip church next week and drive around the city. See if people still need Jesus. Man, it's a God-saved life. Man, we need to understand, man, love your neighbor. When I think about this, I think about Mark chapter 2 with the, with the man who was, paraly- who was paralyzed. Paraly- I completely screwed that word up. Let's go with paralyzed. Come on. All right. And he was outside, and we know the story. It's amazing, right? They drop him. Y'all remember the story? They drop him from the top of the roof. And it's an amazing miracle story, but the sad thing is the Bible says that the reason they had to is because there wasn't enough room in the house, in the church. There wasn't enough room there. The thing that breaks my heart about that story is that if there wasn't enough room, that means that every single person, the reason why they dropped him from the roof is because every single person that came to church passed the man that was paralyzed and didn't even invite him to come into church. And the question I have is if you really love lost people, And if you really believe that God saved your life and the same God that saved your life can save somebody else's life, then why wouldn't we want to talk about this God that changed your life forever? Come on, am I talking to anybody? Are you with me? And so, so, man, we need to have this passion rise up on the inside of us. And and if I were to tell you, man, get out and evangelize. Man, people just have a shaky feeling. They're, like, terrified of this word evangelism. It's like, man, man, I grew up an evangelist. I mean, that's just kind of the way I am. And I grew up, my family, I grew up in prison ministry and doing ministry, traveling the world, traveling the nation, coming in. I just got back last night from preaching uh, twice in prison. Man, hundreds of hands went up to know Jesus. Come on, can we celebrate that? It's just amazing. It was incredible. And, and I just grew up in an event. But if I were to say, hey, I want you to go evangelize with me tomorrow, some of y'all would be like, because <gasps> there's this, this term of like, you want me to go, you want me to go and talk to somebody about Jesus? And it's like some people give me, man, Pastor, I'd rather t- I would rather tie double than have to go out and evangelize. I'll take that too. Come on, somebody. All right, but but it's like this scary term of, man, you want me to go like knock door to door? What? You want me to talk to my coworker? Like, man, what, man this fear of like, man, can I, can I tell you, I'm not sitting here saying, I'm not trying to go radical or saying everywhere, stand on the street corner and just shout, Jesus! I'm not saying like go crazy. But here's what I am saying. I'm telling you this. Every single person in this room, you have a story that can touch somebody's heart. You have a story that needs to be shared. You have a story of hope 
that God healed your marriage. Do you have a story of hope that God healed your relationship? Do you have a story of hope that God brought you out of addiction? Do you have a story of hope that when you thought all hell broke loose, you realized that God is still greater and he is still stronger and every single one of you have something that somebody needs to hear? Somebody shout my story. My story. You have a story. And so there's a, there's a passion that needs to rise up on the inside of you that if you love people, do you have lost people in your circle, which you do, I guarantee you, at your work, there's somebody that's not saved. And if they're in your circle, then, man, are you letting them know about what God has done for you? Are you going to enter their world, not wait for them to come to you, but go to them? This is what God is asking. Are, are you with me so far? So to understand this, you got to understand a love for lost people. you got to understand a couple things. If you want to take notes, the first thing you need to understand is you need to understand a shepherd's love. A shepherd's love. And if you're unfamiliar with the Bible a little bit, here's what the Bible says. It uses the analogy of shepherd and sheep. And so it says that God is our shepherd and that his people are our sheep. Love God, love people. Are you following me? Can I get a yeah? All right. So there's this is analogy is what God uses. Now, how many, is this, how many uh, remember, uh, especially if you got kids, how around Christmas time, isn't it amazing and it's brilliant marketing? It's amazing how they, they actually market like this one thing that you have to get. And it's like it's only available around Christmas time, right? And if, if you don't get it at Christmas time, then you ain't ever going to get it, but it drops like, what, 50% the day after Christmas. But it's just this one thing you got to get. Anybody ever have kids that come up to you and be like, Daddy, Daddy, man, I, if, I, if, I can, if you can give me just this one gift, I'll never, 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 ever ask for anything ever again. Come on, parents, how many feel me what I'm talking about, right? And how many know next year they ask again, right? Come on, right? It's not, it's, it's that one, if I can just have that one thing, man, there's something big about, about just desiring the one thing. Even the world has figured it out. The desire for one thing. Somebody say one thing. thing. There's something that rises up in the passion in Luke chapter 15. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to paraphrase it. In Luke chapter 15, you see the passion of what God has for the one and what Jesus has for the one. And I love how it starts off in Luke chapter 15 where it says that Jesus, it says there were many sinners which are lost people, There was many sinners that came to hear the message of Jesus. I love that. Come on. Do you love that too? Is that many who were lost came to hear who Jesus was. And so in this story, many religious leaders and Pharisees, they didn't like it that he was hanging out with sinners. He was hanging out with lost people. So he was like, all right, let me tell you a story. And he goes on to break a story about how there was a shepherd and he fell in love. He has a hundred sheep. Y'all know this story? He has a hundred sheep. And a shepherd, a shepherd of sheep's love is why he's sharing this story. And all of a sudden what he does is he, he said, well, understand that this shepherd, he loves every single one of the sheep. And he knows them by name. He knows their hurts. He knows their pains. He knows everything about them. A shepherd can pick up a sheep. This is true. A shepherd can pick up a sheep and kind of shake it a little bit and know if it's unbalanced, if a leg's broken, if something's wrong. They know their sheep. Are you with me? And the Bible goes on to say, that one sheep got away. And all of a sudden, the shepherd gets concerned about that one sheep. He leaves the 99 to go after the one. And you might be thinking, like, like it's just a sheep. Like, like are you kidding me? It's just, a, it's, just, it's just one sheep. I mean, it's like if you, buy, if you buy a fish, right? If that fish dies, you good. Just go to Pestamar, you get another fish. It's like, what's the big deal about, about the one? But it's a big deal to God, and it's a big deal to the shepherd. How many know one's a big deal? And when I think about this, I'll never forget uh, a couple of years ago, uh, my wife and I, we dared and we got brave, and we tried to go to the rodeo during spring break. Come on, anybody ever tried that? And like 10 minutes in, you're like, sweet baby Jesus. Am I right? (laughs) And so we went to the rodeo with all four of my kids. Uh Uh-huh. I never believed in those leashes. I made fun of everybody until I went to the rodeo. Come on, parents, where you at? Come on, all right? Control, get back, get back. You know, like, (laughs) I didn't do that. I'm just kidding, okay, but yeah, I did. (laughs) But I'll never forget, we were were walking through the crowd, and my daughter was holding my hand, my oldest daughter, Braylon. She was holding my hand, 
And I'll never forget, you know how your kids get old enough and they kind of want to, they get brave enough, like they want to hold your hand everywhere, but sooner or later they want to kind of like pull their hand away and they want to kind of walk by themselves, you know what I'm saying? It's like all of a sudden they get that identity, it's like, man, I don't need you, I got me, you know what I'm talking about? And you got to remind them, we brought you in this world and we can take you out, right? Okay, so, and so, and, but I didn't say that, maybe. Um, but, um, <laughs> yes, I did. Come on, do that, okay. <laughs> and so I'll never forget, though, we were walking through the crowd and she pulls her hand back and, and lets go of my hand. And I literally, I turn around and she's gone. Like, I mean, I mean gone, gone. And I'm turning her here and she's gone. Like, I'm turning over here, I'm turning around. My daughter is now lost at the rodeo and I have no clue where she's at. I'm freaking out. And I had my other daughter, Avery, my, my third oldest, my second oldest. And I, my wife was going to get the stroller and so I went over there to drop Avery off, and I said, baby, I've lost Braylon. How many know that wasn't an easy thing to tell your spouse? <laughs> and she could have given me an attitude like, you did what? But she did. I was like, babe, I'm sorry. I'm going right now. I'm going to find her right now. And I dropped her off to a scary moment. I'll never forget it. And I went, and for 10 minutes, I kept, my dad went that way. I went this way. I'm running around like everywhere. Probably somebody probably thought I was a crazy white dude. Just running around like crazy. He's like, Braylon, Braylon. They're like, he ate too many cinnamon rolls, you know. And it says, and I, and I was running around like, look, I could not, for 10 minutes, I could not find my daughter. And then finally, thank you, Jesus, there was a worker uh, at the rodeo, had my daughter by her hand, and was walking through the crowd, and I, and I saw them, and I came up, and she came running up to me just crying her head off, and I was crying my head off, and, and I found her, and I brought her back to my wife, and can I tell you, I didn't have the attitude of like, oh, it's just one, I got three more. <laughs> come on, come on, hey. <laughs> huh? I mean, how many parents are like, you kind of want to forget one a day? Come on, am I, come on. Am I right? Like, Jesus just take them for one day. That's all I need. Three hours. Just, just enough for a movie. Hallmark and chill. That's all I need. Three hours. Can I tell you? One was a big deal. One was a big deal. I, I, can't, I can't tell you the emotion that I felt in losing my daughter for 10 minutes. And when I think about my daddy God, and when I think about it, I think about his love for you and me. Can I tell you, losing one to the devil is a big deal. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to, I'm trying to stir you up a little bit because if losing one matters to God, then losing one should matter to us. And if it says that he left one to reach the 99, and then the Bible also says when one comes to heaven, all of heaven throws a party. Then I'm going to, just like it says in Romans, that I'm going to work every single day that I, until the day I die. I'm going to wake up every single day and say, God, you saved me. You touched my life. God, bring me somebody today that I can enter their world and I can bring the same Jesus to them. Come on, can somebody give God some praise? <laughs> say Amen. God is good, man. you got to understand a shepherd's love because he understands the reason why God is so passionate about it because he knows there's a real enemy out there. There's a wolf out there. The reason why the shepherd wants to keep them close is because the wolf is out to get them. But if they're close to the shepherd, the shepherd's got their protection, and he's with them. There's a real enemy out there, and his name is the devil. And I know this is as simple, as simple of a message can get, but how many like simple tests? Come on, somebody. Come on, how many like multiple choice? Come on, hey. Where's my C and D students? Hey. Hey, right, so trying to make this message simple. But here's the there's a real enemy. And the Bible says in John 10:10 10, 10, that he's out to steal, kill, and destroy. He's not only just to come and get you, but he's out to take you out. And I almost feel like God is okay with you going to heaven just as long as you don't bring anybody else to heaven. He's saying, do you really love lost people? He's out to steal, kill, and destroy. And something about that rises up inside of me, which is why I know God called me to be a pastor because there's not one person in this room, not one spouse, not one family member, and generation and generation that I don't want to do everything I got to make sure you find freedom in Jesus. Everything I got to make sure you, you, you open heaven wide open. I pour my heart and soul out every single week we try. 
to let you know that even though you might want to close the book to your life, you don't got to. You just got to turn the page because God's got a future. And he's got a hope for your life. As bad as it is, I promise you, with Jesus, it can get a whole lot better. There's something that's got to rise up inside of you. You say, you know what? I need to tell somebody about this God that has saved me. You got to understand the Father's love. Have you ever, have anybody in here ever lifted weights? Come on, come on. See, let me see your hands. Okay, now how many are still lifting weights? Come on. Uh, okay, all righty. Better than the first crowd. Now, how many of you lying right now? Come on, don't confess in church. How many go once a week? Hey, I see you <laughs> holding up each other's hand. There you go, bro. That's the, way to, that's the way to do it. Confess in church. There we go. But have you ever seen that person or have you ever been that person where you're feeling good about yourself and, and you're lifting heavier weight and maybe you go to the bench press and all of a sudden you put on more weight than what you know you can handle, but you want to see if you got it? Come on, somebody. But you don't got a spotter to help you? Oh, yeah. Come on. Who's been that guy? Come on. Come on. Let me see. Come on. Where are you at? Hey, I like it. I like it. Come on. Me too. And it's like you get up there and you're like, I got it. Ah, you got like chalk for days. Why do you need chalk? You know, it's like, it's like, it's like ah, it's, and you get it and all of a sudden it hits your chest and you're just like, help. help. Come on. <laughs> Come on. That's funny. Come on. Are you in there? It's like. It's like just all of a sudden you have too much weight and you have no spotter. And like, God, how am I going to do this? Ah! Ah! I don't know where that's coming from. Can I tell you, that's the best way I know how to describe lost and hurting people. It's because here they do, they try to take on the weight of the world by themselves. They take on the weight of the depression, the weight of their hurt, the weight of their decisions, the weight of their pain, and all of a sudden they try to take it on all by themselves, and all of a sudden now they're stuck, and they don't know how to press off what is pressing them down. And they don't know what to do. And can I tell you, this is where we come in. When the world is lost and they don't know how to get freedom in themselves, they don't know how to get recovered, they don't know how they're going to have breakthrough in their marriage, they don't know how they're going to have a restoration, it's our job to enter their world and to introduce them to a helper, to bring them the spotter that they need, to let them know that your life ain't over. I know it's heavy right now. I know that things aren't working, but I got a God who's greater than your circumstance. Come on, can I get an Amen. This is what we need. People isolate themselves with the weight of the world, but don't do life alone. You know what? It's our job to walk by and just say, hey, how you doing? Man, let me tell you, man, God put you on my heart. Let me pray for you. This is a shepherd's love for people because even though the devil's out to steal, kill, and destroy, he may take their day, but it's our job to make sure he don't take their life. That's what it's all about. When I think about this, about the one and going after the one, I think about John chapter 4. And I love this part. I love this part of the, the story of this Bible. That was hooked on phonics, worked it for me. <laughs> come on, somebody, help me. This is what you get when you come to second service. Come on. This is all slurred. If you want clean, perfect, come to first service. <laughs> Just kidding. But it's true. So John chapter 4. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible because it shows the power and the love for, for the one. It says that Jesus is the, is the lady that, uh, that was at the well, right? And Jesus, it says that he went out of his way to go and meet her at the well. He could have gone a different route, but he went out of his way for one person. And in this story, what's amazing, this lady, she has a lifestyle of sin. She's a sinner. God knows that. She comes out at noon to fetch water. Nobody comes out at noon, but she was bound in shame. She was embarrassed because of her lifestyle. She was embarrassed because of her mistakes. She came out by herself, isolated, weighed down by her decisions. And if we get honest, we've all been there. And Jesus comes and meets her right where she is. He went out of his way to enter her world. And at this well, something amazing happens. We know the story where Jesus says, hey, will you give me a drink? And he said, in return, I will give you a drink of living water to where you will never thirst again, which is salvation, which is Jesus. But the amazing thing, if you notice, Jesus needed water and she needed water. We all, how many would agree? We all need water. 
and you can't survive without water. Water keeps you alive from the inside out. And Jesus and her had the exact same need. Here's what you got to understand, friends, is that every single one of us, we have the exact same need. And if we can learn to fall in love with people from the inside, it won't matter what they look like on the outside. Because we love, on the inside, we all hurt the same. Come on, come on, you got to hear me in this, right? This is why I love God. Because when it comes to hurt, when it comes to pain, there is no racism. There is no division. There is no brokenness. It doesn't matter if you're homeless and you got nothing or you're a business and you got everything. Pain is still pain. Hurt is still hurt. Brokenness is still brokenness. If we learn to love people, not based on what it is on the outside. Come on, I'm talking to somebody, right? But we learn to love people on what's on the inside. Then we can make true change. Come on, come on, are you hearing me? This, this is why, this is why, man, I don't have time to go into it, but this is why we can't look, we can't look at, Things on the outside. We can't judge people. Like in Mark 2, they judged him on the side of the road and thought he wasn't worthy to come into church. And can I tell you, man, this is our, our, the whoever, like it says in 1 Corinthians. He said, I became a servant to whoever wants to be introduced to this God-saved life. This is a church that welcomes the whoever from wherever. And can I tell you, man, this is why I love this church. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with my wife. But from the very beginning, we pray that God send us a church where you can put diversity together to where money doesn't divide us, race doesn't divide us, parts of the city don't divide us, social economic status doesn't divide us, mistakes don't divide us, but we can love people on the inside and no matter what, we can all come together and we can love Jesus and the God that saved me can save anybody that walks into this church. And that's the beauty of what I love. You may not even know it. Maybe it's your first time visiting. You may not even know, but I love it is you don't even know that we have a mixture here. We have homeless sitting amongst us here today. We have those fresh out of programs here today. We got men and women who own their own business, every race, every color, every background, every single week through prison ministry. I got somebody running up to me saying, I got out. I finally made it. I told you I was going to come. Come on, somebody. I believe this is the beauty of what church should be. I believe this is the beauty of what heaven is all about. We didn't want a church where you come and read the Bible, but we want a church where you come and see it. And you see the Bible by seeing lost people, by loving them where they are. See, I'm fired up about this. By just loving people right where they are to help them get to where they're going. Because when it comes to pain, there's no difference between any of us. We all hurt the same. We all need the same Jesus. We all need the same God. We all need it. Are you? All right. So the second thing you got to understand, and I'm going to hurry. I'm going to try. Got three, three closes. Come on, y'all give me three closes. Is it, is it one, you got to understand a shepherd's love and the passion for, to reach one person. A passion is a married couple to help one married couple. A passion to just help your, help your fellow classmate, to help your, help, help, you've been working with somebody. Man, for the one. Somebody say for the one. For the one. But then also God created something to help us. So we don't have to do it all by yourself. And to understand the passion for lost people is God created a house of grace called the local church. Come on, somebody, how many are thankful for the local church? When you worship today, when you, when you worship today, you couldn't help but feel God. Because there's just something here that's tangible that takes place. When I think about the grace of God in the house of the grace of God. I can't help but think about Luke chapter 19 with my boy Zacchaeus. I don't know if you remember Zacchaeus, but Zacchaeus was talking about, the Bible calls him a notorious sinner. He's not just a sinner, but he's a notorious sinner. Come on, how many know there's a sinner? And then y'all know some people that are a sinner, right? Come on. <laughs> Am I right? And this dude was a sinner. A notor- he was the original godfather. He did. He ran the streets. I mean, he is the original pimp. He, he ran the street. He was the original drug lord in the Bible. I mean, he ran the streets. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that one day he hears about this man from Nazareth named Jesus. And the Bible says he climbs up a tree because he couldn't believe it himself. And then he said, what, there's another dude walking my streets that has a larger entourage than me? Like, who is this cat? 
And so he's curious. He's like, these are my streets. I own this town. Are you with me? He said, like, I'm the drug lord, man. I, I, I'm the guy. I'm the godfather in this thing. And he's like, man, who is this guy? And he sees him walking towards his house. And all of a sudden, Jesus and Zac- Zacchaeus, they, they encounter each other. And something amazing happens. He starts talking to him. And people hate it that he's talking to him. They start, people that have been following him for days and weeks are like, why are you talking to this lost person? And then something amazing happens is Jesus could have easily said, hey, you know what? Maybe we should stay out here and talk. You know, I don't want these people to worry and think I'm backsliding or, 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 or think that I'm, you know, that I don't love them. They're my church people. <laughs> and, you know, I just want to make sure that they know that, you know, that, you know, it's not it's just it's, I'm not going too shallow, but I'm not forgetting them. I'm going to get deep in the word. It's like, I'm, I'm going to be, come on, that's funny. Somebody caught that. Okay, it's like, it's like, it's like, I don't want that. No, no, no. What did Jesus said? He left the many to go into the house for the one. He left their world and he went into his world. And it's just imagine, I mean, you probably, if you could, you probably could name a celebrity that you know is far from God, doesn't love Jesus, is way out there. And if you saw me walking up into the house, there might be some people there like, Pastor Brandon. He's just not loving the Lord like I th- he is not as faithful as I thought he'd. I'd probably get email after email after email. And here, remember though, what did Paul say? He said, I didn't conform to their world, but I kept my bearings in Jesus and I entered their world to lead them to a God saved life. Come on, are you with me? And I love what happens. This is my favorite part. He gets up in the house, and the Bible doesn't tell us what took place. It doesn't tell us the conversation that took place. It doesn't let us know. I don't know. Maybe they're sitting in the hot tub, eating go wings and watching camel racing. I don't know what was happening. (laughs) All we know, come on, hear me. Are you with me? All we know is that in the house, something changed. In the presence of Jesus, something shifted. Because the next thing we realize is that all of a sudden, he's wanting to give back all the money that he stole. All of a sudden, he hits the streets, and every person that he, every family he broke up, every marriage that he misplaced, everything that he did in the streets, he went from being the pimp to being the preacher. And the whole town, come on, somebody, that's a, to me, that's a testimony in itself. But something shifted in the house. And can I tell you, this is my passion for Elevate, and this is what we want to be a part of. Is our passion is we want to create a house that no matter whoever, no matter wherever, it doesn't matter what you walked in here today with. It doesn't matter who people are or where they come from. But then they walk in this place from the greeting from the parking lot, from the high five at the front door, to the worship and the message. There's something when you get in the house, something changes. Something shifts. Something changed because you're in this atmosphere and things begin to take place. And we're going to start to close here soon. But I, I can't help but share some stories about this. Come on, come on! how many thankful that we serve a house that no matter what you walk up in here with, man, people's lives can change. Come on, how many know that all it takes is one touch from Jesus and everything can change? And when I think about some amazing stories in here, I, I, just, I just think about multiple people and and, and to be honest with you, man, I've, it's true. I've, we've had multiple stories, or especially one story that I remember. He finally came up to me one Sunday. He said, "Pat, he's been coming for a while, and he's he's been he's been serving on the uh, he's been serving outside and doing things." And and uh, he said, "Pastor, I gotta let you know. I gotta tell you something. I've been getting high every Sunday coming to church." I said, "You're my hero." He said, "But today, I want you to know, I'm done." He's out there waving the sign like, "Ah, hey, woo!" Just, uh, you know, getting high for the most high. You know, it's like, hey, it's like he's waving his hat, man, man. And then today, can I just be real? Is that all right with you? Come on. I mean, I'll never forget that Sunday. He threw his huge bag, he pulled out his huge bag of weed and just threw it on the altar. He said, this ain't my life no more. He said, because the God that saved you is the same God. Come on, somebody. This is something. This is real stories of life change. This is what it's all about. The guy that saved you, you helped bring it to somebody else. I'm going to brag on him. You don't know I'm going to brag on him. 
But my man Ryan, my man Ryan, who helped set up our lights and, and everything. And Terry, come on, can we show Ryan some love, man? Come on, he's an incredible. He's an incredible leader. You guys can come and join me. Ian, come on, get on these keys. Make me sound better, man. It'll make me hurry up and preach, too. But the deal is, is I'll never forget Ryan when we first met him. He's an incredible servant here, and he, he serves on the volunteer team. And I'll never forget when he first came to church like three years ago or four years ago. And he came from a halfway house. And he came and he was broken. He was an addict. He didn't know what to expect. He was just getting volunteer hours coming to church. And he walked into Elevate, and God radically changed his life. And word for, he's told, he said, I've never been in an atmosphere like this. He got saved. He got baptized. He's been serving. He's out. He's doing amazing. God is doing some incredible things. But you know what's even better than that? Is how many of that's awesome in itself right there, right? But two weeks ago, Ryan's tearing down the screen. And he's breaking it down. All of a sudden, we see him get a phone call. He literally, he literally says, I got to go. And he sprints out of the, out of the church. And we're like, what did we do? I didn't know why he took off. I'm like, bro, what's happening? So me and John, we were just a worship pastor. We were just like, man, what's wrong with you, bro? And so we reached out, and we didn't hear from him in a while. We we're like, man, did something happen? Did we say something to you? What did we do? What did I not say? Like, what took place? And then we finally, we heard from him later. He said, sorry. He said, I got a quick phone call that one of my closest friends was about to use again, and I had to drop everything to go and help them. Come on, somebody. Can I tell you, once God has saved you, once he sa he's left your life, come on, are you with me? Once he's freed you from addiction, you can't help but to have a passion for the God that saved you to bring the same God to them. Can somebody just give Jesus some praise today? Come on, stand with me. Stand with me. Stand with me. They're going to dim the lights just a little bit. Can we close out here today? Not all the way, just a little bit. There we go, right there. Come on, don't leave here today. Because here's what I want you to know. Man, I could lift off story after story. That's just one story. God, I'll never forget my boy Pete. This happened just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, about a month ago, sorry. He came up to me, and he was just kind of antsy to talk to me. He was like, hey, he said, man, I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. So I could tell he was like antsy. And I think it was Jesse that introduced him to me. He was like, hey, you got you to talk to uh, he wants to talk to you really bad. I said, okay. And his first line to me was like, hey, I want you to know, I don't believe in God. Okay. All right, cool, man. He said, man, I got to tell you. He said, he said, man, he said, he said, man, I don't believe in God. I said, I got that the first time, bro. He said, I just want you to, it's important you know, I don't believe. I said, okay, okay. And he kind of went on to tell me as a teenager that his, um, that his parent, both of his parents committed suicide and from a teenager, He's always hated God, and he's never stepped foot back in church until that day. And he's in his late 20s now. And he was actually driving by, and he saw one of those parking signs. that we do. Y'all seen it? We look goofy out there like honk is their first time. You know, hey, best hour of your week. You know, it's like, it looks cheesy, but can I tell you, it brings in souls. Come on, that's why the parking team is every bit as important as the message and the preacher. This is why it's an elevate people thing. We serve together. And then he goes, I'll never forget it. He just, he's like, man, he's like, man, this happened to me and I hated God. He said, I want you to know, I still, I still don't, I still hate God. I still don't believe in God. I said, okay, man. But he stepped back, man, I'll just never forget it. He stepped back and he just said, there's something different about this place, though. The joy that's going around, the worship, the, the everything goes, I, don't, I hate God. Okay. But there's something about this place. And I prayed with him, and he left. And can I tell you, I didn't have the privilege to pray the sinner's prayer with him. And some may think that that was a failure. I don't think that that was a failure. In fact, I think, if anything, God used that moment to be able to plant a seed of faith to let him know every day I pray for him. Every day. I mean, I pray. I'll never forget this story. I pray for him every single day. And I believe that from that moment, God is just going to start beating on his heart. And sooner or later. But can I tell you, he didn't feel it until he got in the house. Because something changes in the house. Something changes when you invite somebody to church. Church, man, I think about it. I'm going to brag on you guys. I think about the Curtis family. I think about these guys three years ago walking into our church. Just broken. She's a teacher and he's a businessman and 
put me on the spot. Sorry, bro. But you'll just have to get over it. I got the mic. But I'll never forget, after church, we sat there and we just talked for, for a good hour or so. And I just heard their heart because here's the deal. We need to create a house where we give equally a dose of grace and truth. Come on, are you with me? It's amazing how people come to us and we like hammer them with the truth. Should have done this, should have done this, should have done this. That's not the way God works. God says, bring them grace. He led with grace on the cross, right? And people will come asking for the truth. It's because of the cross that says he's the way, the truth, and the life. And sometimes you need to enter people's world and get their point of view. You remember I said that in 1 Corinthians. And we just sat down and I heard from their heart. And I'll never forget from that day, I said, man, if you give everything to God, I said, just give me one year. Isn't that what I told you? I said, give me one year to go all in. And can I tell you right now, their marriage is better than it's ever been. Their family is better than it's ever been. As a businessman, he's blessed. He started tithing, started giving. Their life is forever changed. They're incredible leaders. Come on, somebody. And now they're passionate that God that did it for them, he knows he wants to do it for you. God can do it. Somebody shout, God can do it. He can do it. You know what? Say, I can do it. You can do it. You don't have to preach like me. And this is my favorite part. I'm going to finish with this, okay? I promise. The last close. Here, here's, here's what I want to finish with. As I love back into the story. Everybody still with me? Y'all good? Everybody good? Yeah, three people. Okay, here we go. Here's, here, here's, here's what I want you to get. Is I want you to realize that you can help reach lost people. My favorite part in John chapter 4 was after she encountered Jesus and she got saved. I love what it says in the scripture in John, in, uh, let me see here, verse 29. Do we have that up there? John 4, verse 29. Here's what it says. Look what it says. It says, come, this is her. She got saved. She ran back into the village and she's passionate. This is what she says. She says, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? Look at verse 30. So the people came streaming, running out of the village to see him. They came running to the church. Here's what I want you to notice. It said that she ran out there and she said, he told me everything that I ever did. Well, that's not true. Jesus actually confronted her with one thing in her life about the different relationships she had, about the five different husbands and then the one she's living with now in her lifestyle. He just talked about one thing. Here's my point. She was so excited about getting saved, she ran back to her city and she jacked up her own testimony and the whole village still got saved. Come on, you gotta get this. Because so many people think in order to make a difference, you gotta quote so many scripture. You gotta be able to have a theologian degree. You gotta be a pastor. You gotta be, can I tell you, you don't have to. All that you need is your story. All that you need is your moment that you met Jesus. All that you need to do is walking around and let people know how God saved you, how God touched you. You got everything you need. Just give somebody a dose. Sin makes us all need to be rescued. They're not asking you to sit down and break down the engineering of a rescue boat. They just need you to throw them a life raft. Just a little dose of hope. Just something about walking up and just touching somebody and say, hey, I'm praying for you today. I'm praying for you today, man. I'm, I'm, I'm here with you. What, what is it? Here needs to be, this is what your prayer needs to be every day. God, who's the one for me today? Who's the one for me today? I'm asking you, don't get so comfortable within your Christianity that you miss out the purpose of being saved. And that's to enter people's world. Live a life that is an example on how to love God, but then introduce people to Jesus. Are you, are you with me following that? This is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. Every day I pray, God, bring me one. Bring me one that I can talk about you. And you can do it too. You may think, man, my story ain't near as cool. Man, it's like, man, I wish I was hooked on drugs. Like, you wouldn't believe how many people I've heard that say, man, my testimony sucks. Can I tell you, man, it doesn't matter. It's gonna touch somebody's heart. 
Come on, are you with me? Even if you don't really have a crazy testimony, you know what your testimony is? From a young age, I met Jesus. And every single day, I love Jesus. And every single week, I love Jesus. And I never miss church. My testimony is I fell in love with him at a young age, and my love is always last. And it's never faded away. That's your testimony. You can do it. Will you help me build this church? Will you help me? Reach this city. Will you help me reach this world? Will you help me get out into the streets and into the byways and into the schools and into the workplace and talk about Jesus? If you help me, somebody shout, yeah. Okay, we got to wrap up. Anybody hungry? Can we not leave here today without a moment of prayer and worship? Because we're going we're gonna to close out here today just with a moment of prayer. Because I believe worship is our response to God's awesomeness. And I believe God wants to do something awesome here today. I believe he has done something awesome. Do you believe that? But here's what we can't leave with. You can't tell people about Jesus. If you don't first know Jesus. You can't tell them about this God saved life if he's not number one in your life. Jesus didn't die to be a part of your top three. Died to be number one in your life. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around, it's just me, you, and God.